challenging time in an already difficult school year. The schools are also re-examining mask policies, and at CMS, they're scrambling to deal with a record number of guns found in schools. All of this is happening at the same time. So how are educators, students, and parents coping? We're going to hear from three education reporters about this, including our own Ann Doss Helms from WFAE News. Welcome back, Ann. Welcome. Good to be here. She is joined by Shamaria Morrison, education reporter for WCNC TV. Shamaria, thank you, thank you for being here for the first time. Welcome. Yes, thanks for having me. Also here for the first time, Courtney Cole, WBTV's education reporter. Courtney, welcome. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Well, it may be a snow day here in Mecklenburg County for uh, students, but it's not a snow day for our education reporters, although they're all at home this morning. What is the situation right now at CMS with snow and school, Anne? It is um, a snow day for students. That means that they don't go to school and they don't do remote learning, which is causing some questions because on Friday, CMS sent them home with their laptops uh, saying be ready for a remote day teachers were told to prepare for a remote lesson they ended up saying let's just call it a snow day for staff and teachers it is a work day so they can stay at home if there are safety issues and if their jobs can be done at home but some of them are having to come into the buildings and there and will courtney, be a makeup what, day in february courtney what's it like in other systems around mecklenburg you know, it's interesting, um, Mecklenburg Area Catholic Schools, while not CMS, they are also off today. Um, we've even seen some charter schools not within Mecklenburg County also canceling. But I'm, like Ann was saying, I, I know some teachers with CMS personally who said they sent their kids home with Chromebooks over the weekend. And I found it interesting knowing, you know, they did remote learning last school year, even half of the school year before that. So they were, I guess, prepared and then we had the traditional snow day like I used to have in school where there was no remote option. So it's interesting to see how that panned out for them this week. Yeah, CMS is a big system. So if you go to a downtown or a near a downtown school, the roads are pretty good. But as you get further out into the county, they may not be so. And I'm wondering what Union and Gaston and Cabarrus and Statesville, uh, uh, Iredell and, and York County schools are like, Shamaria, do you know? Well, a couple of them are going to be virtual, and uh, many of them decided that they were going to actually um, do virtual learning. So you have kind of a mix of both, depending on the school system. Um, and, you know, you can find a list of what your school is doing. But, you know, to CMS's point, I think that the reason they're a little iffy on doing virtual is sometimes, you know, some of the backlash they got for being virtual, I think it's still kind of in their system on they want to be very, very careful on when they say virtual learning, um, just because they're feeling just some type of way. And I even think that came into the decision of them saying it so late. And that was a complaint for some teachers and some parents. A lot of those other school districts, you know, they said it pretty early in the day that they were either going to be having just a snow day or they were going to be doing taking your laptops home and going virtual. But, you know, CMS didn't make that decision until later in the day. And, you know, even the previous week, I believe it was that Friday, they were like, you know, don't expect any decisions from us before around 430 that evening. What's it look like for, go ahead, Ann, I'm sorry. Oh, I was gonna say, um, from what I can tell, most or all of the surrounding districts have also declared it some kind of a snow day, whether it's a teacher. No, nobody that I know of is bringing the kids back in on their buses today. And I did ask Patrick Smith, who's CMS uh, super, uh, Assistant Superintendent for Communications. And he said, just what Shamaria just said, we looked at, you know, we can do remote learning, but we also know from some of what we've seen that it's not as good for students. So. We did decide to just go ahead and make this a day off and we're gonna bring them back for a day of in-person. There's also in a normal year, they can waive. Um, they can just say, well, we have enough hours. We're just gonna cancel this out. But because of this massive reading instruction program that's very time consuming, they had already redone their calendar and carved out quite a few hours to give teachers more time to do these lessons in how to teach reading. So they're saying we just don't have that wiggle room that we used to have. But yeah, people are mad about all of it. It's a, it's a good old fashioned traditional, let's get mad at the schools for weather closing day. Yeah, this, as we will find out as we go through this hour, people are mad at the schools for a plethora of things, among them uh, masks and vaccinations and the rules on masking and vaccinations and testing keep changing. As we spoke about on Friday's news roundup here on this program, the state has changed its rules three times 
in two weeks. And Anne says guidelines for quarantine and isolation read like the tax code. So Courtney, what are the latest rules on this and on masking from various government uh, organizations and school boards, et cetera, and among the various, well, among the various school boards around the region? What are the rules right now that we know? <laughs> You know, so I believe it was two Fridays ago, uh, the State Department of um, Health and Human Services had updated the Strong Schools Toolkit, which we have seen update itself multiple times in the last year. And on that Friday, you know, they were like, okay, quarantine guidelines are going to change. And previously, it was if you're in a district where the person with COVID is wearing a mask, and the person exposed to wearing a mask, the person exposed does not have to quarantine if they do not have symptoms. Now, of course, if they develop symptoms or test positive, they would have to go home. That was one thing that stayed the same. The other was if they had had a confirmed infection of COVID in the last 90 days um, and did not develop symptoms after being exposed, they did not have to quarantine. Uh, if they were vaccinated, at least partially vaccinated, this also included if they had one shot, two shots, booster shot, they did not have to quarantine. There's a fourth thing in there somewhere. Can't remember it right now, but the interesting part of it is we see so many districts around here, like Union County, that's maintained optional mask ever since August. They have not budged. We've seen Iredell Statesville go back and forth and back and forth, only just recently requiring mask in January. And of course, a bunch of other school districts who have either been optional, changed their minds, swayed back and forth. So it's a wonder, you know, okay, but with these guidelines, the goal is to keep these students in school. It's why it's all this. If this, then that, you don't have to quarantine. But what about the districts who said, nope, we're going to stay optional? It's like, well, if that's the case, you're going to see those higher quarantine numbers. And, and Courtney, I believe it was you on, on WBTV who reported that uh, compounding this confusion is that the charter schools have taken a different tact than the public schools. I think the charter schools uh, um, masking and COVID regulations are slightly different. And I'm wondering why, because essentially charter schools are public schools. They're getting their money from the public school budget. And one of those uh, charter schools I went to was Uproar Charter School. They have a student population of less than 200. So you think about that compared to Union County Public Schools that has thousands of students or Gaston County, thousands, CMS, over 140,000. That's a town or a city compared to Uproar Charter School with only 200, less than 200 kids. You think about it, one, two, 10 COVID cases could wipe out an entire grade, could wipe out the staff. The whole school could end up in a different predicament. And when I spoke to them, I think it was in October, they never changed their mind on masks. They were like, we really just can't afford to. Social distancing, the same thing, all of those protocols for them. It was like they had to take it even up a higher notch. And I'm not, I'm not saying other schools are being lax. That's not for me to determine. I'm not in the school. I don't attend school. I don't teach there. But for them, they were like, we can't afford to not be as strict as we are with these protocols because we, we don't have enough people. We already have such a small population. It's also worth noting that charter schools and private schools within Mecklenburg County are under the countywide indoor mask mandate. So, and it specifically says this includes schools. So, and charter schools don't have to follow county boundaries. So you may have Mecklenburg students who are going to a charter school in Gaston County and vice versa, but if you're in Mecklenburg County, you should be requiring masks indoors. I have heard that that's not always the case, but that's the rules. And, and, talking, and, about those and talking about those changes to the North Carolina's Healthy Toolkit, uh, it's really kind of rewarding those districts who have universal masking policies in addition to who's vaccinated. And so like the test to stay program, um, that's some of those changes. That's the one that you were talking about, Courtney, and I just have it pulled up here. So um, it kind of changes, say, students regardless of vaccination status. And this is only in schools with universal masking requirements. They don't need to be excluded from school activities in brief unmasked exposure. So that's if they're at PE or they're at lunch. And prior to that, it was a little bit different. So they're doing studies uh, right now at this moment on schools that have optional masking policies. But I'm just guessing based on CDC guidance and how much it is, you know, uh, geared towards people who are masked being a little bit more freer to, you know, roam around that it'll probably stay the same. But it's really rewarding those schools who have universal masking requirements and have an increased number of people who have vaccinations and boosters. 
So Shamari, the whole thing is puzzling. There's so many things about all of this that are, that are puzzling. And it's also led to fear, particularly among teachers and around the country we are witnessing, particularly in Chicago and other places, teachers walking out saying we don't feel safe in the classrooms at the moment uh, because of Omicron and, and the fact that officials are insistent in many of those areas, including our own, about keeping schools open. What are you hearing from teachers in this area? Do they feel that adequate protections are in place from masking to vaccination to testing to keep them and the students safe, Shamari? You know, it's such a complicated question. I would say the overall thinking of it is there can be more to be done, but a lot of it you need to have to be able to do it. So for example, and you know, we're talking a little bit earlier before this, and we were talking about uh, how I, I heard one of your reports and there was a teacher saying how eventually they'll have to just hurt 100 students into a gym maybe and have a substitute teacher watch them, you know, well, what else are they going to do if they don't have enough teachers um, because they're either out sick due to COVID or they're resigning? And so those are situations where teachers, students may not feel safe, but there's no other option because you don't have the actual physical bodies um, to have adequate staffing to make this, um, these areas uh, smaller. And, and teachers are talking about this. That's why they're pushing for the higher retention bonuses. That's why you know the teachers, they're saying there's just so many things that they think that the di district and honestly the state can do to make them be safer. For one example is the state is going to be sending down some N95 masks if some if you know districts requested, but also you have HRM Health that's still getting masks the school districts, and so those are just some things that are happening from the community. But I don't think the overall consensus is that the school districts are doing everything they can to keep everyone safe. And well, it varies by county, of course, and it's worth noting that we don't have the same kind of teacher unions that they do in Chicago, so. We've never seen walkouts. There's no talk of walkouts. Um, the Union County Association of Educators has been very vocal about feeling like they are not well protected by a, a consistent mask optional policy. Charlotte Mecklenburg Association of Educators, I recently spoke with their president, Amanda Thompson Rice, and she said, we're not pushing for a return to all remote, partly because it's against the law. So we, you know, it's pointless, but we would like to see all of the piece. And again, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools has had the mask mandate, they said they would like to see uh, more high quality masks available for students and for teachers, um, would like to see more testing available, but I don't think we're going to see a, a Chicago style walkout in this area. We're, we're getting some uh, comments uh, to, uh, as we talk here, one from a teacher who just emailed, or emailed and signed it, a frustrated teacher. Here's why I think the system called a snow day, that teacher says, the decision to send technology that the hundreds and hundreds of parents whose kids were home for various reasons did not have an opportunity to get their technology. We had knowledge of this storm for days, but our amazing principals were only informed to send home technology on Friday. Too little too late. We also have a question about vaccinations of students. We'll get that question answered in a moment when we come back with our three education reporters from FAE, CNC, and VTV at Charlotte Talks. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Generations at Shalom Park, a senior living community in the Jewish tradition that is open to all, offering an active lifestyle and access to the multi-generational Shalom Park campus. Generations at ShalomPark.com. As we go through the hour talking about education and schools, parents, teachers, and students, what questions do you have about what's going on in your school? You can email us right now at charlottetalks at WFAE. FAE.org or tweet us at Charlotte Talks, and we'll try to get as many of those questions answered in the time that we have left. Tomorrow on this program, the Omicron variant resulting in a record-breaking infection surge and pushing hospitals to the brink as the virus continues its rampage. The State Department of Health and Human Services reports that more than 4,000 people are hospitalized, exceeding the previous record of a year ago. We're setting records here, too. So just how bad is it? What are expectations? We'll talk about that tomorrow at 9. Your world, we help you explore it. NATO has just wrapped up talks with Russia in Brussels. It's your community. We help you understand it. This week, Superintendent Ernest Winston offered the Charlotte Mecklenburg School Board a blunt assessment of current conditions. WFAE's Morning Edition is an essential way to start your day and stay connected to your world. Weekday mornings from 5 to 9 on 90.7 WFAE. 
It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about the state of the schools and all of the things they face today in this world in which we live, which is a, a plethora of things, a myriad of things. Ann Doss Helms is WFAE's education reporter. She is here along with Shamari Morrison, education reporter at WCNC-TV, and Courtney Cole, education reporter at WBTV. Bernie on Twitter writes, I saw Lancaster County is doing remote. I think also there were concerns about internet and power outages. My son at CMS early college school was told they would have work, but then they were given a snow day, which I think he deserves, Bernie says on Twitter. Juan emails, why doesn't CMS mandate students be vaccinated? Students are required to have a certain set of shots to attend school. How is the COVID shot any different? So let's talk about that because uh, we know that uh, last year's remote learning experiment was disastrous, and they're trying to keep these schools open at all costs. But we also know that this Omicron variant is highly contagious, much more so than the other uh, variants that we've experienced. And some kids, uh, their parents won't let them get vaccinated. And the un there has been a rise in pediatric hospitalizations, an alarming rise uh, from the uh, of the current variant of this, the Omicron variant. Do students or parents feel safe sending kids back to school and in that environment without getting their kids vaccinated? And if so, why? Well, some parents really believe that the vaccines have only marginal value and that the, it's, this isn't necessarily any worse than a cold or a flu, do which they may watch be the, the news? case. Do they, do they watch the news? Well, you know, again, with children, it is one of those things where you can really see both sides of it. And I know you don't particularly like me. I, I'm not trying to feed misinformation, but it is true that the vast majority of even unvaccinated kids are not getting terribly sick. There are not a lot of school clusters. So, and I am not sure, and maybe one of you knows the, the current status as to whether the vaccines for kids are fully approved or still in the experimental phase. And of course we have a few kids who are school age, but too young to actually have the vaccine. We have pre-K classes. Yeah, so to that point about it being um, just emergency authorized, yes, um, it's still emergency authorized for those kids ages five through, uh, I'm gonna believe up to like 17, but it is still in that emergency authorization uh, status for them. So that's the that's the reason they're not they're not requiring this like they do for measles vaccinations and smallpox vaccinations, et cetera. That's the reason because this is an emergency authorization, even though we know it works. Oh, and yeah. have to and there, say and the there main... have been no serious there have been no serious consequences to speak of with regard to people who've gotten vaccinated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and, and that's just, and those are things that you can, you know, find um, on the CDC's website, you know, um, they have these things available and they have the studies that they do for children um, who are, um, who have gotten the COVID-19 vaccine. And the thing about the CDC and its website, it is very transparent on, you know, what some of these adverse things are for kids. We've heard about some um, based on the vaccine that some of the vaccines are having some type of problems with as far as um, some children's hearts, makes mostly in males, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and with that, you know, with North Carolina and honestly, the school age children, there is a vast majority of them that are vaccinated. And so that's a good thing. We have some of the highest vaccination rates for those school age children, but we also have to remember that for some of these age groups, the vaccine just became available. And I know it feels like forever ago, but some of them are really still, they're just their first dose. Serious illness and or death aside, these uh, infections are infections, period. Uh, and they cause not only student absences, but they're causing all kinds of uh, teacher absences. Courtney, we talked about the, the difficulty that CMS is facing with regard to teacher absences and staff being out. Is that because they're sick from COVID or is it because they're afraid of catching or passing on the virus? From what I'm understanding, you know, we've been getting board updates every Friday. Even the superintendent laid out a plethora of numbers at last week's board meeting from teachers, bus drivers, nutrition staff. And if people aren't sick of, as part of this large number of absences, it's people who are quarantining because they've been exposed, people getting tested, their families are sick. And you think about the domino effect that that's having. It's not just you need a person in a classroom to instruct your students. 
how are they even getting to school when there's more than 100 bus drivers who are absent? And I, you know, I even asked the transportation director last week, I was like, you know, are you able to borrow bus drivers from a different district? Like, how does that work? And he was like, we can't. One, they're not trained through CMS. They haven't done our own training and how we have it with this system. But two, they're dealing with the same things we are, even if they were able to, how could we take somebody from another district that needs their people to be there? Um, so whether it's sickness, being quarantined, family sick, that's a lot of the reasons that we're seeing right now, but it's just, it's scary to think on average of a thousand teachers. I mean, that's going to add up. And it's gotten so bad, Shamaria, that according to CMS, they're covering less than 50% of classes that need substitutes. So what happens in that scenario? Oh, well, that's a bad one. But I also want to go back to the FDA approval for the COVID vaccine. So the Pfizer BioNTech, um, that vaccine is fully FDA approved. And that's the vaccine that the kids are able to get. So correcting what I said earlier, no, it is FDA approved for them. So that's even a better plus and, and it's more motivation for, you know, parents to want to get their kids vaccinated. You have the Moderna who's still working on that full FDA approval. Um, but to the point of what happens when there's enough teachers, and you have a thousand average teachers out, well, you start to go into guest teacher programs. You start to try to pull from your substitute teachers. Um, I spoke with an organization, uh, MECED, you know, they are already in the schools right now, um, helping with college and um, co getting students to college and also helping them graduate. But they decided that their entire office, which is about five or six people, were just gonna volunteer at the schools. And it's because they said they were sick of just saying, okay, something needs to change. They decided to be that change. And that's honestly what the uh, board members are asking for. And that's what the superintendent is asking for the community to get a part of that guest teacher program or try to, you know, try to volunteer or sub. But I will say there is a little backlash to that as well, because teachers who are very specialized in their subjects and who go to school to do this correctly, do not want teaching to become this, you're just watching the kids because it's not that. And so the question becomes, is it worth having people fill in for bodies or do you try to take steps in order to make sure that everyone's safe in the school so you have the actual teachers there who are important to instruction and so people get an idea of, of how bad this is we, we we focus a lot on mecklenburg county but uh, steve eaton is gaston county's health director and he had an unusual word to describe what's going on in the community with regard to covid when we look at the daily new cases of COVID, you can see that we're currently far surpassing the highest peaks of the pandemic by leaps and bounds. The dramatic vertical acceleration of daily new cases is, is um, I was trying to come up with a word, and I think the word is probably breathtaking. Mm. Uh, Courtney, you reported recently that these absences, teacher absences, staff absences, are, are forcing CMS at least, and probably other districts around the area, to make some tough decisions, and among them, remote learning. That is an option, kind of, but the state also has rules about when remote learning can kick in. What are they? I feel like that has been the most confusing thing for a lot of people recently. And when that legislation was passed and signed off by the governor in August, mind you, we're in January now, that was before we saw the Omicron variant. That was before, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know if the Delta variant was here then. I feel like that sprung up shortly thereafter, but we weren't seeing cases as astronomically high as they are now compared to when that legislation was passed. And now, unlike last year where there was plan A, B, C, you can make the whole district remote for four days, three days, two days, that can't happen anymore. That's a law, it's illegal. Now, these school districts are at the mercy of the legislators. At this point, they can only go remote for classes, individual classes, individual schools, grade levels, a wing of the school, but that comes down to the governing body, that comes down to the school board that's going to have to make that decision. If there's insufficient staff due to COVID, if we're seeing these high quarantines, and I've had a lot of parents, teachers, even before the last week, they were like, why is CMS not remote? Why is this district not remote? Why are we sending people back? Why are we coming in to teach? It's not up to the, the, uh, the school board. It's not up to the superintendent at this point to make that overall decision anymore. And even you think about it now, if they go remote, it, from what I've heard from different leaders in CMS, that's not considered an instructional day anymore. It's like they've fine-tuned this so much to where remote should be the last option. And it's 
almost not going to count just like these snow days or inclement weather days that they're going to have to make up. So I know with CMS, uh, at least two weeks ago, they had made two exceptional children's classes go remote. And they've even said since August, you know, the EC classes and preschools have had the hardest time enforcing mask wearing. So that's where they're seeing more of those quarantines and they're having to have these students quarantine and be remote. Um, I haven't heard anything this week if they've had to close any schools or grade levels, but like the superintendent said, it could get to that point where they're going to have to make hard decisions. And the, all the decisions are hard. This is a perfect illustration of that. The, the reason that the legislature passed this law is that we have evidence that remote learning was not good for a large number of students. So remote is not a great option. But as we just discussed, neither is in-person instruction where you don't have somebody to teach the class. Or you have, you know, I talked to a substitute who said, I'm a great history teacher. I did calculus for a couple of months don't know calculus, you know, and if you can't get a warm adult body, then the next steps are also disruptive. What you do is you either say to all of the remaining teachers who are present, you got to take your planning period and go fill in for somebody else, more burnout, more exhaustion, or you take the kids in a class and you say, sorry, we have no adult for you. You're scattering to different classes. You are now in a more crowded classroom during Omicron. No good so choice. With that as backdrop, it seems to me that information and acting upon absolutely correct information is paramount. And the purpose of getting an education is to learn how to think critically. But to do that, you have to have the information to analyze and make decisions on. And yet, in some instances, school systems are reducing the amount of information available to parents to make decisions. And we spoke last week, Anne, about Union County, where they no longer post data on cases or quarantines, why? What their, their assistant superintendent said was with all of these changes in the quarantine rules and the fact that they are complicated, it's just too hard to keep you know, a rolling tally because in five days you could be in and back out. That was true with the old rules. You, know, you would just cycle through in seven days or 10 days or whatever. And I thought Union County had one of the earliest best dashboards because they were very clearly saying, here are the number of positives this week by staff and students. Here are the number of quarantines this week by staff and students. And CMS actually finally adjusted their dashboard, which was very detailed, but really hard to read. But CMS basically finally copied Union County. Now, people are not convinced that the numbers are good, but they're easy to read now. But Union County just said, you know what? We just can't do it anymore. So go to the county website, which you can look at the county website and see the number of school aged children who have tested positive. You can't get numbers for your kids' school. You can't get anything about quarantines. The county, uh, I mean, school boards have been told by the state to regularly review their masking policies. Uh, Eva on Facebook says, we know that masks can help decrease transmission. The Union County School Board has voted repeatedly against a mask mandate. We don't have a virtual option. What options do parents have to keep themselves and their kids safe? What options do they have, Courtney? And what are the policies in systems around Mecklenburg? I know Mecklenburg has a masking policy. What are the other systems doing and what options do parents have? It's interesting because in August, I remember Mecklenburg Area Catholic Schools said they were going to maintain optional masking. And I spoke to multiple parents, some who were like, you know, it's fine. We did the mask last year. We understood if it's mandated, we'll put them on. But if we have the option not to, I'm going to send my child to school without a mask. But there were some parents who were like, well, hold on now. If the county has a mandate, why is the school system not following it? And shortly thereafter, we saw Max require mask at that point, unless there was a religious exemption, medical exemption, um, again, like charter schools. And even when the, the county's mandate, you know, they said this applies to public schools, private schools, parochial schools, et cetera, et cetera. So at this point, if you're a school body in Mecklenburg County, masks are required inside the building. But it's interesting comparing school districts like Union County or Iredell Statesville, where they either stayed optional or gone back and forth. And at this point, I've, I've spoken to parents from multiple districts, and they're doing what they can for their child. I had one parent from Iredell, Statesville, tell me, you know, even if masks were optional for other kids, those aren't my children. So my children will go to school wearing a mask because that's what I think is best for them because she wants to protect them. I believe she has five kids in the system all the way from elementary school to high school, some of which now can get a vaccine, but previously they couldn't. It's like at this point, 
so their children are getting the vaccine, they're getting the booster shot to protect the children in the house who are not eligible by age. So it's, it's really parents' individual choice at this point. But I think you also have to realize if you're sending your kid with a mask and other kids in the class are not wearing a mask, I mean, I saw that at the very beginning of school. There's peer <clears throat> pressure and nobody likes the right. mask. You know, they may be taking it off. So uh, the, the rules keep changing on, on various aspects of this virus from the federal level down. And part of that is due to the fact that this is a new virus. As, as we learn more about it, the rules change about how to deal with it. And as we said, school boards have been mandated to examine their masking rules. I think, what is it, once a month, once every once a month. Every week? Once a month, so they change in because they take a look at the situation in the in the population at large and make a a, a decision. Uh, Anne uh, Shamaria uh, uh, Anne reported last week on an outburst by a Lincoln County School Board member, Mark Mullen, and I want to play that moment, but uh, but I want to warn everybody listening that what he has to say is colorful. So where's any science or basis of this that makes any damn sense whatsoever? I mean, they keep pulling this crap out of their ass yeah. every week. They come up with something new, and this is unacceptable for us to try to run a school system. So how many other school board members around the area, teachers, administrators, students, parents, feel the same way, Shamari? I think you have them. I mean, I was just at the Charlotte Mecklenburg School Board meeting, and, you know, there was someone talking about it, and they're talking about it everywhere. You know, people are not getting their information all from the same source, um, and the source that they're getting them from, you'll hear people say, do your own research, but they're listening to someone tell them what they should be talking about. And so that's really not a thing to do your own research. You have scientists who are actually doing the research, and but you do have school board members. Um, and I don't know which board member it was, but at the Charlotte Mecklenburg school system, the, you know, that vote for mass, it wasn't a universal one, was it? Even though they couldn't really do anything regardless, because again, you know, Charlotte Mecklenburg, you know, the county itself has a mass mandate. So the school district or the school board really can't do anything regarding that. But that is a sentiment among, you know, school board members that mask are kind of just useless right now. Every I, mask I, I, vote. I, I, want to, I want to come back to that uh, comment you made just a second ago about uh, where they get information from. Uh, Molly on Twitter writes, why would my <laughs> child get a vaccination when they still have to wear a mask? They don't get anything for uh, getting the jab. Well, that's the point. You don't get the virus <laughs> when you get the jab. We have to take a break. We'll come back with more. We're here with Ann uh, Doss Helms, WFAE's education reporter, Shamario Morrison, uh, and uh, Courtney Cole from WCNC TV and WBTV, respectively, education reporters at those two stations. And we will continue in a moment. Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Duke Energy, investing in solar and other carbon-free sources to help reduce carbon emissions. More at duke-energy.com slash brighter future. Hospitals are being forced to cancel elective surgeries around the country as they grapple with a new COVID surge. What's happening to those being left in limbo? That's the topic in 20 minutes at 10 o'clock on 1A. We'll get to that in a moment. And did you know, did you know that your smart speaker is also a radio? All you have to do is ask it to play WFAE and you can listen to this station live as you go about your day. Just say play WFAE and we will keep you company and we will keep you informed. We'll continue talking about education and schools and what's going on with uh, those organizations throughout the area as we continue this program in 30 seconds. Stay with us. Year-end climate reports are fueling calls for action on global warming. The heat is here. The weather is here. Yes, we need to cut carbon emissions, but we need to protect our communities. I'm WFAE climate reporter David Borax. Keep track of the latest news on the climate at WFAE.org slash climate news and subscribe to our weekly climate newsletter. Climate coverage on WFAE is supported by the One Earth and Salamander Funds. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about the impacts uh, being felt by educators around the country, around the area, from various different things, <laughs> including COVID, with three education reporters, and Doss Helms from WFAE, Shamari Morrison from WCNC, and Courtney Cole from WBTV. 
Uh, we were talking last week during the news roundup and about Union County School Board meeting, a recent meeting there where masks uh, were once again a point of frustration. And we heard from two individuals. Melissa Falanowitz favors masks, and she asked Union County to adopt a mask mandate, which they have yet to do. To date, masks have always been optional in Union County. Here's Melissa. Right now, more UCPS students are out of school with COVID than at any other time this school year or last. This doesn't include quarantine, just active cases. And the same is true for faculty and staff. Masks can help mitigate this surge. Are they perfect? No, but neither are seatbelts, bike helmets, or smoke detectors. And on the other side of that argument was Brittany Bolden, who thanked the Union County School Board for standing firm in mas making masks optional. Um, I want to take a moment and thank you again for being a voice of reason during what is probably the largest peer pressure campaign in human history. I know it hasn't been easy, but doing the right thing rarely is. The truth is cloth and surgical masks don't work for our respiratory virus. They never did. Fauci and the government knew the whole time and they lied. Now, almost two years later, they admit it after so much damage has been done with us divided. The truth is, that is not the truth. Uh, the only thing that she said there that was true is that uh, we are divided. And that's because of the miss and dis and myth information provided by Fox News and other uh, news outlets and, and uh, Facebook and Twitter feeds, uh, Dr. Fauci did in fact change his opinion on masking as the result of research and a developing understanding of how this virus works. And initially he believed they were unnecessary, but now he says because of what we know about the virus and its transmission, quote, it is overwhelmingly important for everyone to wear a mask. All of that aside, what is the ratio of parents or teachers who would like to see students and teachers masked versus those that don't see them as necessary? Anne. I don't know how you would measure that. You know, you'd be talking about some kind of poll of every teacher and parent out there. It's divided in every district, you know, in the mask optional districts there are a vocal contingent of educators and parents showing up to say please make masks mandatory and melissa the person that you ran the clip from talked about told a little story about you're in a lifeboat with a bunch of people and one guy decides to drill a hole in the lifeboat and he says but i'm not doing it in your space i'm just doing it in my space well your decision just affected the health of everybody out there but in the mask mandatory districts there are also people you know the votes have been split Sean Strain and Rhonda Cheek in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools voted no on the mask mandate. Now, in fairness, I don't think that they really wanted to end the mandate right now. They just said they need a better process for defining when, and Rhonda actually didn't speak at all, but Sean said, we need an off ramp. And another board member said, we have it. It's there with the county. They've set the standards for when we'll release that. So everybody's divided, but what the proportions come down to, I just don't even think anybody has that. So, Sir Mario, earlier we touched on another possible reason for teacher and staff absences. It's not just fear of the virus or even uh, being sick from the virus. It's the fact that a lot of people, not just educators, but a lot of people in all career areas, have, have, have used this pandemic period to trigger a reevaluation of their career pathways. And many people are stepping away from things for which they train and in areas in which they work. CMS has offered teacher incentive bonuses. Uh, they did that at the end of last year, and now teachers and staff are pushing for more. Have those bonuses worked so far to retain teachers? It, it depends on who you ask. And so you know, we got some data from CMS last year, and it was data as it was fresh as December 7th, but 871 teachers had resigned as of that school year. And we know those numbers are, you know, maybe bigger now. 
And so sometimes for some people, the money just was not enough for them. I, I spoke to one teacher and I'm gonna tell you, she was at Olympic High School, which actually saw the most uh, staff resignations. And she said that it wasn't just COVID, it was safety protocols. It was how students you know, responded to her teaching. And she said there was just such a lack of resources. So before you had all these teachers having to be out because of COVID-19, she said she never had a planning period um, because she had to continue to keep on um, looking at other classrooms she just didn't feel that um people took their safety well enough and and it comes in with you know the guns in school the weapons that are in school those are things that are making the teachers say that they just don't want to do it anymore do you know what she meant when she said the way students are responding to her teaching what does that mean oh and you know absolutely um i think it's the uh, lack of respect in school districts and you know schooling it's twofold. You have when the parents are at home and teachers, and when you don't have sometimes parents responding to teachers, um, it becomes hard to teach because teaching doesn't stop. Um, you know when the bell rings, you need that interaction at, at home. And you know if she can't get a response from a parent, and when the and when the student may have become disrespectful, she says, "Well, what am I supposed to do? I kind of put my hands up. I don't know." She just feels like it's just not the same, but. You know, sometimes that could just be a generational thing, but that was kind of her thing. She just didn't feel like students are responding the same way they did when she started teaching 20 plus years ago. We've been talking about this for a long time, the fact that sometimes teachers feel unsupported both by their uh, administrators and by parents. It used to be parents would support the teachers. They take the teacher side. They don't do that so much anymore. Courtney, you wanted to chime in on this. Yeah, I wanted to go off of what we were saying about those retention bonuses. Like Shamaria said, you know, it depends on who you ask. And right around the time they were getting ready to vote on those bonuses, I talked to the CMAE uh, president, Amanda Thompson Rice, and she said, you don't teach for the income, teach for the outcome. Both are important. And if we truly want to say, I'm going to keep saying it, if you want the nuggets, if you the brightest, you the nicest, I'm sorry, and the brightest, you have to be able to attract and retain. And we've seen petitions coming out from educators here just in CMS, you know, pushing for more on those retention and, inc and incentive bonuses. They're like, you know, why are we only getting X amount of money compared to Wake County schools that got double? And again, you know, money's not everything. It's not going to cure all of your problems. But you think about, I've talked to some people, some teachers who have multiple jobs. They leave school and they go to the grocery store. They go to the mall. They go to wherever they're going to pull the second job on top of now having eight, nine, 10 extra students in their class because there's not enough teachers there they're afraid of being sick or they may have been sick and they're just now coming back after being out for five, 10, however many days. And it's like, you know, money's not going to fix everything, but when you have so much else going on, like Shamari said, the lack of respect in schools, you've seen the violence in schools at multiple schools across the district, might I add, it's like many of them are wondering, well, why would I stay? What's keeping me here? And then on top of that, the retention bonus got split in half I know a teacher personally, she was like, well, I'm already leaving before May, so I guess I'm only going to get half the money, even though I should get the whole thing. It's like many of them are wondering, why would I come in? Some it's parents I've spoken to, even subs, it's like, what's the incentive to sub anymore? These teachers uh, have gotten teacher bonuses at the end of last year, and now there's a question about they're asking for more teacher bonuses. And if they get that money, where is it all coming from, Shamari? Where is this money coming from? Um, so it's coming from ESSER funds, which are funds that came from the American Rescue Plan, the COVID-19 funding. And so basically, it's a big pot of money um, that schools can use um, pretty much for their discretion regarding really alleviating things for COVID-19. But the thing about those funds is you kind of, they're at the state right now. And so before a school district can use that money, they have to send it to the state to approve it. But I, you know, I spoke to a couple of board members, actually, um, four at least said that they would like to see um, the teachers teachers and all staff, honestly, get higher retention bonuses. And also we have to remember that this, this money, this was in the millions of dollars, like 300 plus million dollars. And I won't say they spent a small amount on teacher retention bonuses, but it's not comparable to the, you know, how much money they just did get for. And so that's where the money comes from. I read a, a, a Twitter comment from Molly a little while ago. Why would my child get a vaccination when they still have to wear a mask because they don't get anything for getting the jab? To which I responded, yeah, but you don't get the virus. She has written back saying, but my kids and many kids with vaccinations have already had COVID. Many with boosters are getting Omicron. 
what about that? I mean, if the, if the, if you still, what I understand, and maybe I'm wrong about this, is that if you get the, the shot, you may get, even with the booster, you may get the virus, but you don't get very sick. Shamaria? Um, I would ask her, she's on Twitter tweeting right now, that means she's alive. I hope her <laughs> children are still with her, that means they're alive, and that's the point. I had COVID-19 in that this wave of Omicron, and I was like, oh my gosh, I can only imagine what would have happened if I was not vaccinated. And that's the point. And teach, talking about school and why it's so important to have teachers there, we learned about science that it evolves. Science evolves. And so to be honest, we know that the science is working because as new information comes out, we change things. And I, it's weird to me that people are in this space where they feel like if we say one thing about masking today and another tomorrow, well, that means everything's not true. That's not how science works. Um, it's working how it's supposed to work. <laughs> you wanna chime in on that, Courtney? Yeah, I, I was gonna say the same thing. Um, okay. I got my Johnson & Johnson shot in March. I got my booster shot in October, Moderna, and I got COVID right at Christmas time. But I'm blessed to be here having this conversation with you all. I did not go to the hospital. Um, I didn't have any extreme effects of getting sick. I mean, I had cough, sore throat, couple of other things, but the point was, and what we keep hearing is, if you're vaccinated, you've gotten your shots, there's a lesser chance of being hospitalized or dying. That's not saying that everybody has not died or been in the hospital, but there's a less severe chance of that happening, which is why school systems in the strong school toolkit, they can't require vaccines. They're, they can encourage people to get them. That's why we're seeing these um, the health department's coming out and having these vaccine clinics on school property where they're encouraging staff and students at multiple districts, you know, if you want to, you know, we encourage you to get it. So I, I would say to this woman, you know, at the end of the day, it's her choice, it's her life and her children. But at least conversations I've had with my family, especially those with underlying health conditions who could have a higher chance of being sick or dying. It's like, hey, you know, you might want to go get your shot. So in the four minutes that we have remaining, let's talk about something else that these schools are facing right now. Uh, guns in schools have been a major concern, particularly in Mecklenburg <coughs> County. Uh, has, but has this filtered in and to other school districts in the area? Ha are guns being found elsewhere on campuses other than those at CMS? I don't know because there's not good real-time data available on this. You'd have to check with each district and I have not done that. Um, one of them said, no, they're not seeing a lot of it. But the reality is we hear about these behavior problems. We hear about guns and you look around and this is happening with adults. You know, we're stressed and we're angry and we're demonizing each other and we're buying guns in record numbers. And that's, you know, one way or another, that's how the guns are getting to the kids, whether it's, you know, not locking them up, whether it's stolen guns or whatever. So it's hard for me to imagine that there is no threat in the surrounding counties. This is pretty clearly not just a Mecklenburg County thing, but it does seem to be happening very intensely here. One thing I want to add with oh, that sorry, here sorry. in CMS, sorry to interrupt, um, okay. is the guns are being found. They're either being found during safety screenings, they're being found, unfortunately, after a fight happens, or it's been reported by a student or staff member. So we're seeing, you know, them being found, which is the positive thing. Not, that's not to say that these weapons are not on other school districts. They may just not have been reported or they may not have been caught. But I spoke to a therapist a couple of different times. Uh, she was with there helping students after the Butler High School shooting in 2018. And I had a conversation with her and I'm like, you know, what, what is it going to take? What, what do we think is going, is it going to take to see more stringent security measures? And she was like, something already did happen. A student was shot and killed at Butler. Nothing changed. Those are her words, not mine. And she's like, you know, I, I think we're kind of already past that point of what we should have done, could have been done in 2018. And speaking about, you know, violence and guns in other schools, we saw in Salisbury how at the Christmas tournament, there was a shooting there and there were, it was a 13 and a 14 year old who got shot and there were minors who were the ones, you know, who were arrested in it. And I've sp spoken to some students and I'll be honest, it's, it's really sad because they're scared. I remember at Mallard Creek High School, the fight that happened, well, multiple fights at one time. And there was a student who reached out to me on Twitter and she said, I don't think you all understand how scared we were because we thought everything was out of control. 
And I mean, it's a very sad situation when students don't even have that type of um, encouragement or feel safe in their own schools where they're supposed to be learning. It's a, it's a sad situation. Both Union County and Mecklenburg County have in initiated these programs called See Something, Save Something. And I'm curious about how successful they've been because in Mecklenburg County, Crime Stoppers has upped the reward from $250 to $500 for information resulting to the arrest of somebody who brings a gun on campus. And so far, so far, nobody has reported anything. So are these efforts, and I have 30 seconds, are they successful? And Well, again, if... If guns are being found, that is in some ways a success, whether they come through Crime Stoppers or through an anonymous app or through somebody going to a teacher or to you know, a school resource officer. What we don't know is what we don't know, what's out there. And very, qu very quickly, th th we're coming up on a school board election year here and around other school boards around the area. Given all the things that the schools that we've been talking about are dealing with, Ann, what do, what do voters want from school board members? I think we we're going to find that out. This is an unusual year for CMS because it is an even numbered year. We had a year delay. Does that mean turnout will be higher? Does that mean there will be new candidates? I think there's, we could have a whole show on school board elections, and I bet we will later this year. How about that? Ann Doss Helms, our education reporter here at WFA. She was joined this morning by Shamaria Morrison, education reporter at WC and CTV, and Courtney Cole, education reporter at WBTV. Thank you all three for the hour. Charlotte Talks with Mike Collins is a production of 90.7 WFAE.